Hey everyone, Rob from Southgate Media Group here. Before we get started with this podcast, we have a quick message. If this is your first time checking out the show, we love that you found us and we really hope you enjoy it. What we have to say is for the subscribers. If you enjoy our shows, would you please donate to help keep these going? We don't want to have to put traditional ads on these shows, but this does cost money. So we really do rely heavily on donations. To make a donation to the show, please go to our website, www.southgatemediagroup.com. Go to the page for the show, and in the upper right-hand corner is a donate button. It takes you right to PayPal, and you can donate whatever amount you want. Thanks a lot for listening, everybody. And now, on with the show. Hi, welcome back. This is the SMG Blacklist Podcast, episode 12 from season 2, number 71, The Kenyan Family. I am one of your hosts, Jack Wendrowski, number 23 on the list, and with me is... Number 13, Melissa Maxey. So, we've got a whole lot of things going on this this episode, kind of a Waco-style a terrorist uh, group uh, called the Kenyan family. And and so uh, the setting, you have a uh, kind of, uh, the, they show this, this church and the pastor starts talking about this uh, incestuant relationship. What was it? Lot? He had Lot and his daughters. And his daughters, which was supposed to be a horrific tale about, you know, the, the sodomy that was going on and Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. Of course where sodomy comes from, right? <laughs> right. And you know, the the tale of, of how he had really disappointed God and and the fire and brimstone was coming out. Of course, by the end of the sermon you figured out that this guy is preaching about sleeping with the children in his kind his cultish church. And <laughs> So, <laughs> on top of... Little, little polygamy action going on there. Yes. So, you know, the government has been investigating them. They've got barrages of lawyers. And on top of it, see, or unbeknownst to the, the government, Red has found out that this family has a whole cache of weapons. They make their money from by holding terrorists' uh kind of weapon stash. So if you need a, you know, a, a, a missile rocket launcher, you go <laughs> to the Kenyan family compound, which is in the middle of nowhere, on hundreds of acres, and since it's considered a non-for-profit church-type site, and I'm going to say church-type, as it was not a real church, so they couldn't, the FBI couldn't trespass. It's like a big safety deposit box area, you know, like in a bank. <laughs> they hold all their weapons. So, everything is, kind of, everything is kind of going along, except a uh, wrestler gets captured and, and dragged through the forest, similar to a couple episodes ago. <laughs> <laughs> and that, uh, that did get a couple of uh, Twitter parts. And so, now that they've got to, now they have to go uh, rescue wrestler and investigate and get into the compound and the local police really aren't figuring to be cooperative. Yeah, the local police don't want them getting on the compound because they they know that they're storing, they have weapons and they don't want to have anything happen. But when they do get on the compound, they find that, um, and the reason they get on the compound is because Kenyon has been off the grid for several days and all of his all of the um, gangs and that have their weapons there are, like, antsy because they're like, what's going on? And so when they get on the co- compound, they find that all of the adults are dead and Kenyon is missing and all the children are missing. And that's how they get, um, when they find all the storage boxes, That's they find this little girl and Liz wants to get her off the compound. And that's when they get in that big wreck because the, the little girl calls them the watchers, um, um, runs their car off the road. Their SUV off the road. 
<laughs> so wrestler gets trapped and Liz wanders off into the forest by herself looking for some sort of help, leaves the officer with Wrestler, and then they get attacked, and then that's when Wrestler gets dragged off. Right, yeah, I think I kind of jumped the shark there on the on the Wrestler capture. Of course, what everybody's figuring is that the Preacher has dropped off the grid uh, because he's hiding out. Yeah, they think that he's going, cause because the whole thing behind his cult was, that his family was going to be, what, taken up into heaven, be gone for six days, and then come back, and it was going to be like Armageddon. Right. And so they they thought, oh, he's doing his scenario, and he has all of our weapons. He's going to be gone, like, disappear for six days, and then he's going to just, like, <laughs> hellfire and brimstone everybody. Right. You know, so, yeah, there was, it was funny, the, uh, it, you know, this week in the Agent Carter podcast, the, uh, we talked about, uh, last week's, uh, episode of Agent Carter that item number 17 was a gas that the, that the bad guys were able to put in this theater. And everybody attacked themselves. So they, you know, they put a, a crowbar into the handle of the theater and everybody was trapped in. And of course, everybody attacked each other and no one survived. And it was funny because my first thought was, you know, they have some sort of, you know, some sort of chemical, similar chemical weapon. Yeah, to what they used when they gassed all the people in the church, you know, in their church while they're having this service. Right. And everybody's like running for their lives. They get trapped in there and get killed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, I thought it was like some weird <laughs> Agent Carter leftover, but. <laughs> no. <laughs> But what the what was left over was the the preacher started to have competition from as as the boys would get older, you know he didn't want competition he didn't want these boys getting older and maybe taking over the the compound from him. Yeah, so he so he was supposed to marry three wives and he he you know as when he married those first three wives and they started having children like over half the children were male and he knew that was going to be a big problem so he, to rectify that what he decided to do was have like a lottery and pick eight to ten boys have a big feast for them and they were about the age of like puberty age and then he was supposed to like he told them that he was you know gonna they were going to be killed or whatever but instead he let them go because he couldn't kill them so he let them go. So they were like this wild tribe of boys. And it reminded me of um, Lord of the Flies is what it reminded me of. <laughs> like, seriously. <laughs> yeah, like, in high school, we all had to read the book. Lord of the Flies. The Lord of the Flies. Of course, it, I think the intent was to let them perish in the forest. But the boys survived, especially led by the pastor's, his first son. Yeah, David. David. And so David not only survives, but helps all the other children survive. So he becomes their leader. And while he's out in crazy, crazy land, he decides that the original Kenyan pastor has, has gotten soft. Yeah, he's an apostate that they're going to, he's not doing what he's supposed to be doing. So he's going to take over the responsibilities, um, of what he believes God is telling them to do. Right, which is basically. about bringing out the Armageddon. Right. And of course that is that is not good for America and <laughs> so yeah, that's when the FBI kind of has to come in and you know just the interaction with all all the uh with the with it David was, and it was pretty interesting. I it was nice seeing Samar have a more active role in the episode because she was the one see what happened um so they showed a piece where there was a, uh, it was kind of like <clears throat> out there, they had a, there was a van and there were caught, these two cops like were like, what is this van doing here? And they go to check it out and the van blows up. Well, so Amir, um, Amar finds out that a couple of the vans, another van is missing off the compound. So they know there's another bomb active. Well, they find this van and it has a small child in it and some, and Samar is like, she remembers what the cops say right before it blows up about, oh, it's, uh, then it blows up. And they kind of say the same thing in this moment. She's like, oh, she puts the piece together and she goes up to the boy and she's like, um, he's like, I don't know, is he eight or something? He's really, he's not very old. Ten or something? Yeah, he was and very young. Definitely not old enough to even figure out. He was, 
what he was doing or driving. And he, yeah, so she she gets him out of the van and tells him, you know, the only people that are going to get killed are her and him, and she doesn't want to die, and she doesn't think he wants to die. Yeah, of course, you know, he had his he had a uh, uh, the, the kill switch on on his thumb, so all he had to do was press that. But even after he got caught. He's just kind of sitting there rocking back and forth and, you know, something about penance and... Yeah, he's know. totally been indoctrinated, you know, he's um, separated from his mother and um, Amar is the one that finds his mother and brings her in and she comes in and Samar brings his mother in and it takes him a little while to figure out who she is. Yeah. And then she's the one that tells Samar about the boys and how they... You know, when they're at a certain age, he lot he pulls a lottery and takes the boys, has dinner, and then takes them out to the forest. She mm. was the one that told that story. So they were they were able to get like at the very last possible minute and uh, you know kind of save the day. Although poor David, who I don't know if if he would have been redeemable. Uh, I guess you know, but what they did was they they thought he was going to explode the van. And take all the agents. And so, you know, when, when, uh, Liz tried to talk him down, got him talked down, you're better, you know, than your father. Said, yeah, you're right. And then they, you know, they get a clear shot and they just have to take it. Well, the, there was another boy. See, this part, that part was confusing. Oh, that's small right. Small bit. Because there was a, another boy from the compound in a tree. And I thought he was shooting at Liz. No, he, he yeah, actually he, meant to shoot David. He shot David. I guess because David wasn't going to explode the van? Yeah, maybe. Yeah. And so Liz ducks, and then the FBI shoots the kid in the tree, and he falls. But, you know, Rustler was taken captive, and Liz was taken captive. And, um, you know, it was kind of cool to see, you know, Liz and Rustler, like, um, secretly figure out a way to get untied so that they could get weapons. And right as they got weapons, the FBI showed up. <laughs> <laughs> That's all it. So, I could, during all this, uh, Reddington is, he went back, he's trying to find uh, the, uh, the, the safe that was Fitch's. And so, he, Reddington goes back to the DMV guy, and uh, he says, yeah, you know, I, I, he gives him this whole sob story. You know, I've never really been out of the country, and <laughs> you know, and, and Red's like, absolutely not. And and then he tells him the story, and Red's like, well, you know, I suppose we could. And he says, well, actually, I was born in London. I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah, I like the Glenn and Red exchange was pretty funny because I mean Red was so flustered over the whole incident of having to be there to rely on this guy to get information about something that he should just be able to get on his own and he's just so flustered and um there you know the guy's name is Glenn is and he's such a troublemaker he is you know he just makes Red work for every last piece of information and he just enjoys twisting it around and Red just, like, follows the law, you know, it's just like, it's, he can't do anything but do what he says. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, talking about Glenn, I, I think I mentioned uh, before we started recording the show, Glenn had a little bit part in Birdman. Oh, yeah, that's right. Uh, Birdman is kind of a, I guess, a artsy-fartsy, uh, it's a story about a, a guy that used to have this character called Birdman, and he made millions and millions in the box office, but was not considered a mainstream actor. He puts this show together, he puts, you know, his life, his whole career, and along, so he gets, uh, he rents out this theater, and one of the extras, one of the theater workers, is Glenn. I saw him, like, walking down the hallway, because <laughs> Glenn is, like, about three-fourths the size of a regular dude, and, you know, like, no neck and no shoulders. And it was unmistakable as he walks down the hall. I was like, hey, it's Glenn! <laughs> Actually, what I said was DMV guy, but... <laughs> That's funny, because, you know, when <laughs> Glenn gets on Red's um, jet, because he, like, finagles his way to get across the country to go on this trip with Red, 
And they get over there to uh, St. Petersburg, right? And they're, he's like, it's in this building, it's on this floor, and they're ransacking this hotel room. Like, the whole place is trashed, completely trashed. Like, the walls ripped, the furniture's overturned, and they can't find anything. <laughs> and Red's like, are you sure that it's in this place? And Glenn's like, I'm sure, I'm always sure, and I'm sure about this particular thing. And he pulls out a piece of paper, and he says, and it's in... Room 112 or something like that. Red's like, we're in 221 or something like that. 212. <laughs> 221. <laughs> and Dembe's like wandering around, like shredding everything. And, 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 and Red's, Red's still talking about, didn't, didn't uh, Glenn really offend one of the stewardesses? Yes. He's like, I was on a plane with you for 13 hours. At 12 of those hours, you had your shoes off. And then you insulted my flight attendant. And, and he goes, oh, he goes, I thought your flight attendant was pregnant. It's <laughs> like, oh, my gosh. It's such so, a great, great character. Now, I see a post, uh, let's see, on TV.com that they're the, the limo that Red is driving actually has a... Uh, a U.S. flag and some sort of and some sort of seal. It said maybe a presidential seal. Oh, so uh, so, so where red. That comes from. Okay, okay. So what happens is they find the safe. They open the safe and it has a card with a number on it. So the next thing we know, we see Red and Dembe, and they show up on the compound, the Kenyan compound, and they go inside the church area, and he pulls the pedestal, like the altar pedestal that he was talking at, like up, like down, and underneath it is an entrance. And he goes down there, and there's a car, and the car is, he pulls the sheet off, and it's a 1968-era Nixon limo. And he gets the key that he got from that episode with the key. He opens the car door, turns the car on, and it's playing a song. It's Beyond the Sea. And it, it plays the, like the chorus or whatever. Uh-huh. And then he gets out and goes to the trunk. And he opens the trunk and there's a briefcase in there. So he takes the briefcase to, and gets back to Dembe. And Dembe says, the, we can't trace the number. It's a blind, um, like we're gonna, it's a blind exchange. So Red calls the number, and a guy answers, and Red is like, I'm calling about Alan Fitch, on behalf of Alan Fitch. And the guy on the phone says, um, oh, you found the safe. And Red's like, who is this? And then they leave it there. And so, and I, I played it over and over trying to see if I could figure out who the, guy is on the phone but i can't i can't recognize it so it could be someone red knows or thought was dead or i mean it could be anybody i have a feeling he doesn't really know and he's just trying to find out but i have a feeling that this briefcase is fitch's fulcrum like his uh his version of it yes that, that if this council ever turned on him that fitch would have this which would make the actual fulcrum less uh necessary. So I don't maybe they go together. Yeah, maybe they go together. Maybe Who knows? The, maybe the briefcase I mean maybe the briefcase is the way that he, they're gonna be able to listen to whatever's on that device that Liz has. Because I mean, maybe coming up to the future, we need something that can keep Red alive. And right now Lizzie is the only one holding it because she thinks that she needs it for something and she doesn't know what, but we all know that what she's holding on to and keeping from everybody else is uh, Red's ticket to life. <laughs> You're right. Of course, you know, maybe it does have secrets and, you know, maybe she's going to, you know, deem that he can't have it back. And she's, at the end, she's still insisting everything is strictly professional. Well, yeah, because he buys, he has, I mean, they have their late conversation and he tells her he he bought her an apartment because she needs to move out of the motel she's in. She's like, I'm happy where I'm at. And he's like, you're anything but happy. You're like the most miserable person I've ever seen. And she tells him to butt out. She tells him that they're basically a professional relationship and he shouldn't even think about trying to get her to, you know, be anything other than that. Well, and, you know, I think if it had been maybe a regular apartment, it would still have been kind of sketchy that a major criminal has set her up with this 
really nice house. I think, you know, even in, even in kind of make believe land, it would have been a real stretch for, uh, an international criminal to buy an agent. <laughs> this... <laughs> so, of course she well, can't. It's like some sort of peace offering or yeah. something. Like he's trying to win her back or. He's yeah. always trying to win her back because she's, I know. she's always going through this, uh, you know, I love him, I hate him, I love him, he's my dad, he's not my dad. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it, it's part of that, you know, we want Liz to to kind of get past this, and she's just not going to. Well, she will, and there's going to be a catalyst, and we know what that's going to be in the next episode. Yeah. So what do you think it's going to be? Well, because they they showed the preview for the next episode, The Deer Hunter, and it shows Tom in a mirror, and he sha- he's, like, shaving his head, and he's, like, shaving his beard, and so Red told him to stay away. And he's coming back. Of course, we knew he wasn't going to stay away. Right. With Tom and his little smirk and 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 all the women of the blacklist. Oh, my gosh. They're, like, going crazy, fan crazy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Tom. I, I posted a picture on, on our Instagram account, the blacklist pod, with a picture of uh, Tom Keen. And I swear it got 100 hits <laughs> in, like, an hour. And I'm like, whoa. He, he, he is definitely the, uh, he's definitely the sex symbol of the blacklist. I, I know Spader with the fedora is very handsome and, you know, I'm sure he's very popular with the girls, but the, the one that's gonna be on the teen magazine is gonna be Tom. <laughs> yeah, Reddington has his own following of ladies. <laughs> oh yeah. The fedora, the fedora following, uh, femme fatales. <laughs> Yep, and yep, all the ladies wear their fedoras during the blacklist. So, were and, you wearing uh, were you wearing yours, or was it uh, carefully tucked away in the closet? No, I was wearing mine. Oh, good, good, good. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna try and find. I don't know what. Uh, I was gonna try and find out what kind of fedora he wears. That uh, red, actually, the brand. Is oh, I know. A- we need to find out this stuff. I know. Now, I've seen an actual Stetson fedora, and it is very nice. <laughs> they're, they're made very well. So. All of his suits are very nice. I've got a, uh, I've got a Hats in the Belfry one that, uh, it's, but it's got more like a pork pie curled brim, and mm. I've got the, uh, Panama hat that I actually got in Puerto Rico. <laughs> Which is probably, you know, he's worn he's worn that one. <laughs> that is true. But I think my next purchase will definitely be the Stetson Fedora. <laughs> yeah, we need to find out for sure about this. <laughs> so let's see. Let's see. Did we we rescued wrestler? We've got the compound. I know I'm missing. Okay, so Harold. Let's Harold. talk about Harold. Because Harold, at the beginning of the episode, is driving in a car with his wife, and they're arguing because she wants him to start this trial. And he's like, I don't want to think about it. She's like, I don't want to lose you, so I want you to call them and see if you can get on this trial. Like, well, so he, through, the, through the episode... He tried to ignore it. Yeah. So he calls. He calls them to get on the trial, and he gets a phone call from the doctor about halfway through the episode, and they give him bad news. They tell him he can't be on the trial. They, they tell him they don't have enough spots. Right. So then, you know, the, is it the director that comes in? Director Tom? They, he just called him Tom. Yes. And, and he wants Harold to be, what does he want Harold to be? The new director? Yes, he wants him to be the new director. And that's when Harold says, you know, no. And he says, oh, you can't, you can't tell me no. And he says, no, you don't understand. I can't get into this trial. Yeah, Yeah, because he tells him he's sick, because he didn't know he was sick. Right. He tells him he's sick, and he's trying to get into a trial, or because it's life-threatening. So, later in the episode, after, you know, he kind of comes back in and says, Oh, by the way, I've got you in the trial. Yeah. (laughs) And, of course, you know, what, you know, what, what's the first thing out of Harold's mouth? (laughs) I know. Oh, he wants to know whether if he just bumps somebody off the trial. Right. He's like, I'm not going to be on this trial if I'm, like, taking somebody else's place. Exactly. And so he says, no, 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 I got you spot number 36. And uh, Did he say, like, 
There were 35 spots. And right. He, and he now, added a spot for him. And now there are 36. I think, you know, how'd you do that? And he said, I think he said something like, uh, I forget. It was like, uh. He knew that, he knew the guy that was, he knew the doctor that was doing the trial and he called in a favor or something. Right. It was like, yeah, I, I called in a favor. So just about the time we think, oh, at, you know, probably at the end of the season, we're going to lose Harold, which would be a shame because yeah, I, he's just got a very commanding presence. I think of of so many of the agents, he really seems the most, he and Samar have the most realistic uh, demeanor. I think Amir uh, in that I Amar, Amar is, is um, he's really perfect. Wrestler, I think still, I, I think maybe because of the whole drug thing, and he just kind of skirting that line, but it's to me there's some kind of disbelief I, I have to kind of go through to keep wrestler in that position because in real life there's no way he would have gotten this far. It, but on the other hand, they kind of you know we kind of forget for episodes at a time that he's going through this pain. Right. Oil. Oh, speaking of ignoring, uh, uh, what are we? Uh, what is one of the things that um, we, that they haven't talked about for a while is uh, shoot um, oh the uh, Liz's uh, investigation on, on the dead body <laughs> yeah that's gonna come up when uh, we see Tom next week probably I would I would maybe not in the next episode but maybe the episode after because I'm, I'm suspecting Tom's gonna end up being right at the end of the episode. I think the only way they get is they give up Tom on this because first off, you know, Tom, we know Tom's coming back. Tom's not supposed to come back. Mm -hmm. Tom is not good for Lizzie and even at best is never going to be. And he's going to make Red really mad coming back. Right. And so, you know, maybe Red doesn't kill him, but here's my prediction. Red gives up Tom for the murder Liz gets away scot free, and Tom goes to prison. So we don't lose the character Tom. <laughs> it really works for everybody. That's kind of a that's kind of a win win situation. It is the the we love Tom fan club wins because Tom's not dead. Red is happy because Tom is behind bars and being punished, and Liz doesn't go away for life for a conspiracy to commit murder. Yeah, and Red's pretty much got everything over Tom because he knows he's going to be a dead man if he speaks one iota of any sort of agreement that they had. <laughs> oh, yeah. And instead of not talking to Red for 15 minutes, I think this would go into, like, the first 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe even 30 where she would insist they're never going to talk to each other again. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm wondering about the whole Harold situation. If maybe whatever he has was something that was given to him on purpose, and maybe they're going to play that out in an episode later in the season. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's a good. That's a good point. You know that maybe the doc, you know, the trial or whatever, or the, I don't know, somebody gave it to him, and maybe the trial when he's going through the trial, he'll they'll find out that it was part of an experiment or something. Yeah. So what do we have left on the show? I think. We've covered a, a quite a few things. Is there anything anything left that, that we haven't talked about? No, but I wish they would give Dembe more like talk time. Yeah, I don't know. He he might be the the strong silent type, but he hasn't even got much screen time lately. Yeah, I'm hoping as we get uh, as Tom gets reintroduced into the show for the season that we'll see Dembe more because I I really like his character and I really like. Hisham Tafiq really well, and um, I just think that he's he's really good complementary to Red. Um, so as being his bodyguard and being a strong man. So so yeah, we'll we'll get Tom back. We'll get uh, you know we'll see if if Dembe gets a little more play. You know they just did you know basically a whole show kind of about Dembe. Although Dembe didn't even get a whole lot of screen time. <laughs> on that one, you know, he showed up at the beginning as a kid, and he showed up at the very end, not wanting to kill the guy that, that got killed his family. That, killed his family, backing those terrorists. Yeah, that was a really great episode. So let's see. I've got some. Let's look at some Spader news. Uh, 
he's been nominated for Best Performance by an Actor in a Television Series Drama for uh, 2015 Golden Globes. Uh, Spader is the voice of Ultron in the new Avengers Age of Ultron. Everyone's excited for that release. Yeah, especially if you're not just a Marvel fan, but I assume some of the Spader fans will be... Uh, uh, oh, yeah, they're they, talking uh, about it all over Twitter, like with the Blacklist and stuff. They they combine the Ultron with Blacklist posts. Yeah. And uh, Spader on the character Ultron, he said, the villain is bat blank crazy. <laughs> And can you imagine, you know, the the kind of things that we love about Red's character? Yeah. I'm really looking forward to the the kind of interaction that that I'm sure that he's going to have as that villain. Yes. <laughs> I'm really looking forward to it. I'm going to um taking my kids to see it. Yeah. And let's see. Uh Harry Lennox, uh, there's a uh, on movie phone if you get to uh, a chance uh you know, check out the the stuff about season two. Uh, he talks about this season is really going to be season one on steroids. <laughs> it has been so far. It it really has. So uh, he he talks about the, them really amplifying the show, and uh, you know they want to really give the fans more of what they want. And uh, you know they've really kept Red in, in that same genre. And they're going to get uh, you know, more guest stars to play the blacklisters. I think. Yeah, that's what's going to be so fun is to see who's going to be guesting as a blacklister. Because they're going to get all sorts of people coming in. Yeah, they've really only had one. I think they've only had one or two uh, really popular actors. And right now, I, I can't even. There was that one in particular where he was part of that peace group, and it wound up he was actually. Uh, you know, really part of the the problem, and he was the one that got uh, Debbie oh, yeah. killed. And was it um, Fonda? Fonda, thank you, Henry Fonda. Henry, uh, not Henry. Uh, I mean uh, Peter. <laughs> Peter, his son. And uh, so, yeah, that that's going to be a good thing. Uh, let's see. Other than our Twitter, can you think of any other links that uh, we want to share? It's, like I said, movie phone, uh, TV dot com. Has some great stuff. Uh, I've been um, following Serial, Serial dot com. They have a lot of updates. They they're the ones that we talked about with the last season. They had the list of unanswered questions, and they're always posting pics uh, for the new episodes and updates. Um, they update each of the episodes afterwards. Great. So I think that's uh, that's really the majority of I think what we really have. Is there anything else you can add to the list? I don't think so. All right. Well, it seems as far as our list, we've gotten to the end of it for today. This was the SMG Blacklist podcast. This is hosted by the Southgate Media Group, which you can find at www.southgatemediagroup.com. You can click on a variety of podcasts, The Biters, Cuckoo for Who, uh, the our new... Melissa and I have the new Harry Bosch podcast, and uh, I have the the Trumpet Talk uh, podcast and and blog. And what do you have, Melissa? You have some some Twitter addresses for us. Yeah, our Twitter address is Blacklist Pod, and our Instagram and our Tumblr address is the Blacklist Pod. And what about Harry Bosch? Our Bosch is. Bosch Pod. It's at Bosch Pod for our Twitter. And um, you can find us at SouthgateMediaGroup.com. And that's the end of our uh, 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 selfless... Uh, or, or <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, our uh, self-promotion. Self, self-promotion. <laughs> and uh, let's see, what else? Uh, and, oh, don't forget to please, if you really enjoy these podcasts, really click. There's a donate site. And if you donate... There are uh, premium content, things that you can get a hold of, and uh, and there's also other sponsors on there, like the uh, Tweet uh, Audio Headphones and Audiobooks, and so and really keep listening. Go to iTunes and and make us uh, do some great comments and favorites so other people can find us. And I guess that's about it. Until next time. 
See you then.